Like that is one of the things we're trying to do here is get some enjoyment back into farming, mm -hmm. right? The only way we're gonna appeal to a younger generation or continue to keep our children on the family farm is it has to be fun. Mm -hmm. And we've done that by allowing them to have some skin in the game. You know, if they're invested in this, not just financially, but emotionally. So now they can come out and they can see their own cow. Mm -hmm. That cow has a name. You know, it almost becomes a friend to them. They're just checking up on them. We really enjoy just having our space, being able to raise our kids out here where they can literally roam wild and um, just enjoy life. They're not cooped up in a backyard and we have to worry about traffic. They're out exploring and playing with the piglets and trying to catch a chicken. And it also, yeah, just teaches them responsibility. They all have chores like washing and collecting eggs and they help us in the garden. Yuchi? Cool. Hello, I'm Casey Robinson. I'm 27 years old and I live in Grand Prairie, Alberta. I'm actually originally from Merritt, BC, so I grew up um, in a pretty small town and a lot of my friends lived on farms. Myself, however, I was always stuck in town and kind of wishing and dreaming about having that future for myself. And up until this year, that wasn't possible, but I'm very grateful to finally be out here. I've got 10 beautiful acres of land, um, a couple of critters already. And yeah, it's definitely been interesting over the last few months getting everything set up. So career-wise, I'm a certified personal trainer as well as a certified nutrition coach. So I do online coaching um, with clients all over the world. So I have clients in uh, different parts of the province. I have clients around Canada. I have clients in Mexico, all these crazy places. And I'm really grateful to be able to work and help people with their health and fitness goals and live their best lives. So I actually just recently heard about regenerative farming through my friend Kelsey. And he was actually putting together um, something with some very bright individual to really kind of go over what it really entails and what it looks like. And I thought it would be the perfect opportunity to you know, learn a little bit more for myself, see how I can work that into my farm, into my property. So I decided to jump in and join the project. So I'm excited to learn and bring what I learned back here. Hey, you must be Casey. Hey, Amber, how are you? Good, so nice to meet you. Nice to finally meet you. I've heard so much. Thank you. You found your way out okay? I did. Yeah. It's gorgeous, gorgeous spot. Yeah. yeah, I think Kelsey's actually just grabbing some stuff from the truck. Uh, but come on, I'll come show you around. Cool, sounds good. Are you excited to get moving on this, Casey? Yes, I'm so excited. I'm honestly a little bit nervous for some reason, but excited to learn and see how everyone else does things because I am just winging it and I don't really know what I'm doing at this point. So, yeah, I've pretty much been going off of YouTube and some like Facebook forums trying to figure things out. Is there anything you're hoping to find? Um, honestly, a way to spend less money on food for sure, because just by buying a lot of food right now, I'm noticing how much it adds up because they eat a lot more than I anticipated. And what did you think? What did you, like going into this, what did you think? Um, I honestly didn't really expect it to be what it has been, but I thought that one bag of feed, for example, would last me two, three weeks. Not really the case when you, you know, have quite a few animals already, so. How many animals do you have? So I have four goats, I have two piglets, I have 12 chickens, two ducks, four dogs, and one cat. I feel like there's lots of potential here. So right now, a good portion of it is canola field, um, but I'm not gonna be renting it out to the farmers anymore because I want to you know, start my own thing. I would eventually like to potentially get cows. 
So it'll be really good for me to go around and see what everyone else is doing and you know their way of doing things because if I were to go pick up a cow tomorrow, I would have no idea what to do with it. I wouldn't know how to fence it. I wouldn't know how to feed it. I wouldn't know how to get the water from point A to point B. Yeah. So there's a lot of learning to do and a lot of things involved, right? Lots of little moving parts, so. We are here at Becky and John's farm. It is Stone Coast Farms. I have never really seen this kind of operation before. I don't really know what I'm getting into yet, but overall I'm just really excited to dive in there and just learn because this is something very out of my realm and this is their world. This is what they do for a living. This is what they do, you know, for their family. And I'm just excited to kind of learn what it is they do and why they really do it. So yeah, I'm just excited to get in there um, and just, you know, absorb everything that they can share with me. Hello, hi, Casey. Nice to you, Becky. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, John, nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. So tell me about your farm. What exactly do you do here? Um, we do um, grass-fed beef, mm -hmm. pasture-raised chickens, pasture-raised mm -hmm. turkeys, free-range eggs, and we have a few beehives. Wow, that's pretty different. I've actually never seen beehives. <laughs> Yeah, we felt there was kind of a nice addition and really helped with like the pollination mm -hmm. and uh, kind of a nice complement to our rotational grazing and that that we do with our cattle as well as our poultry and our pigs. Oh wow! The chickens, the pigs, and the cattle all graze over the same land, not at the same time, but we try to mix it up. They also have kind of their own like unique qualities. So like with the pigs, they're a little bit more useful in terms mm -hmm. of where it's compacted yeah. because they're able to root up everything. Yeah. Whereas the chickens will run over and they're really good at kind of really concentrating like nitrogen and stuff like that. Oh, okay. And then the cows, we do kind of fast moves throughout our pasture. And yeah. it's just a, a good way to eat things down, trample it down, and then also add their uh, manures and stuff as a fertilizer. Oh, so, okay, okay. Yeah. So can you show me what it is that you do? Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, okay, cool, I'm excited. So what benefits does regenerative farming have for the land and the soil? Um, so when we first started farming, we really wanted to focus on like improving the land, improving our knowledge and just making a better ecosystem. Yeah. And so that's kind of how we fell into regenerative farming is always improving, mm -hmm. um, using the animals to um, improve our pastures, improve our haylands and mm -hmm. also just to have nutrient dense food. We try to focus on growing as much uh, forage as we can all the time so the more uh, plant matter you grow above the ground yeah the more roots you have growing under the ground and that's putting uh, carbon back into our soil yeah feeding the soil biology as um, well as it's helping with like moisture retention as well as um, like in wet years it's holding more water instead of pooling and running off yeah and in the dry years you know we're still seeing really good growth um, and then kind of another factor we've started to really notice is just the biodiversity we see on our farm. Wow. Okay, we are wrapping things up here at Stone Post Farms and we had such a great day. I learned so much, um, especially about rotational grazing. I think my favorite part of the day was definitely moving the cows, also watching um, everyone else step in cow poo. That was great as well. But we are going to head out here and I'm super excited to check out the other farms. So they gave me a chicken, we're on our way. My name is Dr. Derek McKenzie, and I am a soil scientist at the University of Alberta in the Faculty of Agriculture, Life, and Environmental Sciences. So my, my background is not in agriculture, so I have been learning a lot about conventional and regenerative agricultural practices in Alberta. Historically, the grassland soils of Alberta were maintained by large bison herds. And through the action of grazing, a lot of carbon was stored in the soil. And so we can emulate that kind of ecosystem function with best management practices and cattle grazing. And that's what regenerative agriculture is trying to do. It's trying to um, emulate those uh, natural ungulates on the landscape through management and, and increase carbon sequestration into soils through rotational grazing and adaptive multi-paddock management. So the question is, why do we want to store more carbon in soils? And so when we talk about healthy soils, soil health is really just a metaphor for soil function. 
And so function basically is, is a concept that can be governed by what we need the soil to do. For example, a healthy forest soil is not necessarily a healthy agricultural soil because we don't expect them to do the same thing. And so for a healthy agricultural soil, we expect it to grow food, to grow biomass for food security, to store water and retain water for crop production, to provide nutrients for crops, to store carbon, and to have a functioning and diverse microbial community. And so really, yeah, the, the, so we can talk about the plant soil microbe continuum and, and those three factors are all connected to each other. So with the plants feeding carbon to microbes, microbes eating that carbon and storing some of it in the soil, but also mineralizing nutrition they feed back to the plants and the soil is sort of the whole um, biogeochemical environment that this is happening in. So biogeo and physical environment. And so healthy soil should include elements of microbial function, carbon sequestration, water retention, and, and plant growth. Right, so the reason carbon sequestration is important is because it's one of the parameters of soil health, but it also has the ability to mitigate climate change. So even if we're net zero tomorrow, so there's no more additions of carbon to the atmosphere, we need to scrub 20 billion tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. And soil could, could be a large part of that. So there's gonna require lots of solutions in lots of different sectors, but in the agricultural sector, sequestration of carbon in soils um, is gonna play a huge role in climate mitigation. And regenerative agricultural practices that increase carbon sequestration while maintaining plant productivity and yields um, are going to be our best chances at success in the future. All right, we just rolled up to Telehuan Farms and I'm so excited. I've learned a lot at the last farm that we were at, but I'm nosy and I want to know more. So we're gonna go find Ben Campbell. He's over with the cows right now, getting ready to move them. So let's go. Hello, I'm Casey, nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Ben, nice to meet you. This is beautiful. This actually reminds me of home quite a bit. Oh really? Yeah, but I'm assuming I wanna watch out for this. Yeah, that's electric. <laughs> That'll get you. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so you have 300 head of cattle and 1,500 acres. What does that look like for you? Uh, well, it's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, it's pretty fun. We try to do everything in a, in a nature-based approach. So because of that, instead, the nature-based means that we, we choose a natural method of doing things. We mimic nature versus a man-made method. And the benefit, one of the many benefits of that is that when you don't have to do man-made approaches, mm -hmm. there's a lot less work involved. Yeah, I've noticed there's actually a lot of grass out here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is a really bad drought. Like, yeah. uh, if you look at the pond here, it's, it's completely dry. We're hauling water with a truck. Um, and this is, uh, four out of the last six years have been bad droughts, but this is by far the worst. Yeah. And so even though, despite this being a really bad drought, we've got this, so they're finished grazing in here. I'm gonna take them out. They've been in here for 36 hours. Okay. And this is also the second time this year that they were here. So it, it grew, we grazed it, we left it, and then it regrew, and now we've just grazed it again, and then they're gonna come off of it. Okay, so how does the drought really affect you? Well, normally, like they're in here for 36 hours. I've just put them in, uh, right now for like that I would normally split it in half and I could probably get them in here for twice as long so we're I mean most places in this area have about 20% of the grass that they would on a normal year because of the way that we graze we probably have 50% or 40% of the grass we normally would have it's still not great but it's it's a lot better and the other benefit is like you can see there's probably four to six inch long stems here those are gonna regrow next spring really quickly so if we do get rain they'll be able to grow and and come back whereas once they're grazed really low it takes almost a full year for them to recover wow yeah, yeah that's a lot how long have you been doing this for um i bought my first cattle 10 years ago i bought four i had no idea i'm not from a, a ranch background so i didn't know anything i was an engineer doing construction <clears throat> my first book was um raising beef cattle for dummies you know those black and yellow books yes, yeah i know exactly that yeah yeah so that was my my intro into into ranching with four animals um 10 years ago and then i've started i learned the rotational grazing because i didn't inherit a ranch um 
that I needed to make money to pay the bills. And rotational grazing is a really uh, economically viable way to run a business. So um, I started doing that right away <laughs> in order to keep in business. Yeah, it's it, the whole thing is about biodiversity. So um, like this pasture behind us, that's the last pasture we're going to go in in this area. And we grazed that for um, two days at the start of June. And now it's been resting and regrowing. Theoretically, it's been an unbelievable drought, so it doesn't grow in a lot. But that's been resting since June. So that little piece of land that's only had cattle on it for two days uh, in the last year, and then it's going to have cattle on it for another one day, and then they're going to be gone. So that's one of the things that I really think is fun about cattle is they share an ecosystem. They give all this space, and yeah, there's a lot of cattle here right now, but they're all going to be gone again and not come back for another year. So, you know, they're only going to be here for a total of three days, I think, this entire year. So it's for cows three days, and then 362 days of the year, it's just for wildlife. Yeah. And even when they're here, this is full of, this is mountain lion habitat, and there's elk in the spring calving um, on, the, on the ridge. There's grizzly bears and foxes and coyotes and red-tailed hawks. It's, a, it's a, a great way that cattle can like share an ecosystem, so you're still producing food for people, but you're not in any way taking away from nature. Actually, they've done studies where um, having cattle increases the biodiversity. Yeah, no, that makes absolute sense. Okay. Um, so my name is Donovan Kitt, and I farm on the homestead, is the name of our farm, with my wife Lisa and our two boys, Murray and Everett. Uh, and my dad's here as well. And the reason we call it the homestead is when Lisa and I, we first bought our first piece of land in 2015, and it was a kind of a classic homestead. It was 160 acres, and in order to get your, uh, your land title, you needed to clear at least 30. So it was 160 acres of bush with a 30-acre 30, 30 field cleared. And uh, so of that cleared land, they took all the logs, built a cabin, and so we lived for three or four years in like a one-room log cabin, no running water, no power, and we just had like a hand pump in the middle of the house, and that was where we got our water from. And uh, so we just referred to it as the homestead, and I guess it's stuck. Like once you start calling calling yourself a name, then that's that's the name. Got a few chickens off the hop, and then a few sheep and a few pigs. And when you're hand pumping water, like chickens, not too bad. Sheep, they don't drink too much. Pigs drink a little bit more. But then we got a few cows, and it's like really hard to keep up to, uh, <laughs> to hand pumping for a cow. Like they can drink faster than you can pump it. So yeah, we had the 160 acres. And 2019, we had to make a choice, like if we were going to kind of say, use that farm as a stepping stone, and then move on to uh, the farm that I grew up on, which my dad, my dad was on. Um, so we decided to do that, and we sold that farm to a couple friends that are doing great, and they're having raising their family there, and they're loving it. Um, but yeah, we built a house here, and then expanded our cattle herd, and we uh, kind of amalgamated our our pig operation with my dad's, and we started doing a bunch of pastured poultry and expanded that. And one thing that we've been really focusing on lately is uh, grass-finished beef with Gall Galloway cattle. And so we've grown the herd almost, yeah, we've close to doubled it. And we have about 35 breeding, breeding animals right now. And we direct market everything. We don't sell any live animals. We just sell steaks. So what exactly are you doing here with these cows? Well, we're, we're turning this grass into beef. Turn this grass into beef. And what's up with these hay bales here? They're not oh, yeah. stacked or? Yeah, so this is, uh, we do something, it's called bale grazing. Okay. And so it's kind of like, like we move our cows, you know, like every day in the summer. But in the winter, what we do is we lay out all the winter feed. So that's all these bales. Mm -hmm. And we lay that out in the grid. And uh, then we move them depending on the weather. Mm -hmm. Um, like we'll move them every week, every 10 days. Yeah. So you just give them a line of bales. We have an electric fence that goes in between those bales. And then so they just only will eat what you give them. Yeah. And then also when it's cold like that, mm -hmm. you don't want to be running a tractor. Yeah, right? no. Right, because the cold is hard on equipment. Not. Yeah. So what's neat is like we take them out the bales off the field, we bring them out here, we line them up, and then like that's it. No more mm -hmm. tractor. Like we won't have to start a tractor to feed bales from basically now. Mm -hmm. until, um, well, we, like, ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> until we hay again, right? Yeah. Move more bales out here. Yeah, exactly. So that's pretty cool because then you don't have to start that equipment in the winter mm -hmm. and, like, plug it in and, and, yeah, burn all that diesel fuel. 
And what else is neat is because, so you're moving cows to bales, not bales to cows. Yeah. And so these cows, they are going to, you can see how it's everything's really nicely gridded out and they're really evenly spaced. Yeah. And so if you were to look at an aerial photo actually of this pasture that we're on right now, you'll be able to see like every single bale mm -hmm. and there's kind of like a green ring around it. Yeah. And so that what that does is that when the cows eat all that hay, it like really evenly distributes like all of the, like the urine and manure and like leftover hay. Mm -hmm. And it turns the, the worst part of the field into the best part of the field like in one year. So I can show you what I mean. Yeah. This is what that field looked like last year. Wow. Right? Like, isn't that pretty stark? So this is this is what we would, like last year, this is what this field looked like. And then you feed hay on it. And, and now, it's almost like doubled in size. Oh, like there's 10 times more forage here. Wow. Yeah. And you can even feel it like under your feet. Yeah, I was like going to say, it's, it's, so actually, it's, it's like bouncy. Yeah. Yeah. You can see how there's some leftover hay. Yeah. And so what that does, like that'll decompose and that just becomes topsoil. And so like really quickly, you're building, like you can really increase the amount of topsoil you'll have on, on your land. Yeah. And then also this, like more topsoil, more organic matter, mm -hmm. like that really um, positively influences the amount of water that land can hold too. Mm -hmm. Because your water is held up in your organic matter, in your soil, like your carbon in your soil. Yeah. And so that, you know, if you have a hard, like a big rain event or, um, you know, like the spring melt, mm -hmm. Like that's all going to be held in your soil rather than like running off. Yeah. And so it makes your land a lot more resilient. So Lisa showed you chickens. Yep. You saw pigs. Pigs. Um, you saw ducks. Turkeys. Turkeys. Yeah. First time seeing turkeys ever. Oh yeah. I was a little scared. Yeah. So those turkeys, they're, they're called Beltsville. They're like one of the most endangered turkeys species out there. Those are the white ones. The white right? ones. Yeah. Yeah. So we started raising those because they're they look like a normal bird, but they're quite a bit smaller. And we just raise a few of them. My dad loves turkeys. Yeah. So like, you know, if there were no turkeys on the farm, it'd, it'd make them pretty sad. So, yeah. Yeah. And then we hatch them all on the farm here too. Oh, I didn't know so, that. So yeah, we have breeding, breeding pairs and... Yeah. So at my small farm, I've got quite a few acres of canola field right now. Okay. How could I turn that into something like this? Yeah. So, do you have cows? No. Oh, you Not, need cows. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I need some cows. But another cool way, like when we're, we're just starting out, is just with pigs. Yeah. You know, you get some pigs, I've got train two them pigs. to an electric fence. Yeah. Right? And they're like edible rototillers. Yeah. And they'll go through and they'll like work all that up, you know, kind of, and then you go in behind them and uh, you can kind of smooth it all. Or if it's already cultivated, you could put in a cover crop like peas and oats, mm -hmm. and the pigs will just love it. And they'll like chew all that up and they'll work it into the soil. And then you can kind of make it a nice seed bed and seed it to something else that you want. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks very much for coming out, Casey. No. Like your, your interest in this project, it's pretty neat. Yeah, thank you for having me. I've learned a lot. Yeah, definitely a lot. So hopefully I can take a lot of it back, utilize it on my much smaller scale farm, but nonetheless. Well, that's how they start. Exactly, right? Yeah. So yeah, I'm excited. Hopefully get some cows. Sweet. Speaking of cows, any of these uh, suit your fancy? You can, if you want, uh, we sell custom sides. That one right there. This one looking at itself? Right here, yeah. Okay. That's the one. <laughs> all right, the blank tag. Yeah. She's all yours. My name is Mark Boyce. I am professor of ecology at the University of Alberta in the Department of Biological Sciences. So about seven years ago, I initiated a, a, a research program funded by the Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada uh, in, a, in a new program that they have called um, Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Program. And the idea was to try to find ways to uh, reduce emissions in agricultural systems, but also to sequester and store carbon uh, in, in, in grassland soils in this particular case. And we were evaluating alternative grazing systems to see which ones were most effective at, at sequestering and storing carbon, as well as uh, influencing other uh, ecological goods and services. So there were a, a number of surprises, I thought, in, in our, our research program. But one of the really uh, interesting results was the the, the fact that we had an increase in uh, water infiltration in the soil in 
uh, AMP grazed systems, meaning um, adaptive multi paddock grazing systems. And we had increased infiltration of water into the soil and increased storage of water, meaning that if you have a drought next year, you have more moisture in the soil to carry over to help, through, help you through that drought period. So water infiltration is a really important um, attribute of, of a, a grazing system. In addition, uh, AMP grazing increases uh, avian biodiversity. It increases uh, carbon sequestration and storage. It increases the microbes that, that actually uh, fix methane into the soil. There are a number of, of uh, positive outcomes from AMP grazing that, that really benefit the soil and benefit the ecology of the, of the area. Welcome to our ranch. We're in Good Fair, Alberta. I'm Clay Armstrong. This is my wife, Ash Armstrong. We have a cow-calf operation here uh, with just the two of us and our two young kids. We focus on regenerative agriculture predominantly around rotational grazing and trying to do all year round grazing and keep the animals on the land as long as we can and follow a lot of the uh, six soil health principles. So tell me a little bit about the history of your farm. So we've been here for three years. Mm -hmm. We had just purchased the, uh, the ranch off another organic producer mm -hmm. and uh, we are in an event that we were hosting on soil health and they had approached us you know, wondering if we'd want to take, you know, kind of our regenerative journey further. And by doing that would be, you know, on a place that has the land to accommodate growth. And this place basically checked all the boxes. You know, it had the space to do it. It had the infrastructure in place, you know, the electric fencing to promote our rotational grazing plan, but also it had the water infrastructure with a drilled pipeline. So we have a pipeline that actually, it'll provide water to eight different quarters on the ranch. So in drought years, you know, water is, well, water is important all the time, but especially in drought years. And we always have fresh, clean water to provide the cows, so. You mentioned something about soil health earlier. Yep. What was that about? A lot of kind of the premise behind what we're doing is based off these six soil health principles. Okay. And one of them is the context in which you're doing it in, and then keeping the soil covered, introducing livestock, minimizing tillage, whether it be mechanical or chemical, keeping a living root in the ground, so keep things as green and growing as long as you can, and allow a rest and recovery period for the land. Okay. And what we found that did, especially the rest and recovery, is it promoted a healthy root system. So if you can get those roots deeper into the ground, ultimately we were drought proofing our land without really even realizing we were doing it. And we didn't realize we were doing it that way, you know, for drought resilience, till we had drought. And now we're in three years of drought and we still have green grass. Yeah. So we got to test our theory Yeah. and uh, it hasn't let us down. Yeah. And did you guys both grow up on farms or is this something you kind of had to learn? Yeah, we uh, were first generation farmers. Mm -hmm. We uh, decided we we're going to raise our kids out in the country. We wanted to raise farm kids, not city kids. And uh, so we bought a quarter section of land and then it started. Yeah. You know, we, we knew we needed cows because we had too much grass. So we had to get learning, you know. Mm -hmm. So we hit the books, you know, textbooks, YouTube, things like that. And we just started to learn. And the ranch here, so it's been certified organic since 1996. And that is something we kept on. And uh, the animals, they're not certified organic, but all the land itself is. Yeah. And it, it is a challenge in some things, but the reward that you get from it, you know, through observation and using an animal to, you know, impact that land, sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's positive, but all that comes through the amount of observation that you put to it. You know, we see, the wildlife increase, bird population, insects, 
Like as an ecosystem, everything seems healthier. We've got a creek, you know, that runs through about three quarters of a mile. And uh, we had a study done and there's over 126 species of plants wow. that are along the creek. And so with that amount of diversity, and if you allow those animals to pick, you know, it's kind of that salad bar that they have. We're here to work with nature, mm -hmm. you know, forcing it. Yes, there's the tools that we can force our hand and try to get the results we want. But really, you know, it, uh, the biggest return, you know, on our investment, our time invested, is seeing when the abundance of wildlife is coming here. Yeah. Because that's telling us, like, the health of this land, it has to be, if it's drawing in, you know, wild animals in abundance, we got to be doing something right. Yeah. You know, our animals, our cows, the bees, you know, we've had chickens and pigs, you know, and uh, now we're focused just on the cow side of it. Yeah. But all of it, you know, is that much healthier. So. Yeah. So even here, like, this is a fairly high traffic area, but this shovel does not want to go in very well. Where if you've had a living root in the ground and you've had the soil covered, you won't get quite that compaction. So what we're seeing here, you don't have much for root depth. There's a little bit down below, you know, it's kind of flaky just hard yeah hard and compacted shallow like this little clover plant is trying its darndest but it just can't seem to get down there it can't break through that compaction so I can feel lots of roots which is good so you can really tell the difference just in color mm -hmm. from that other one so you can see this thatch layer, that's a lot of the residue from the bale, but it's breaking down. You got roots coming out the bottom and there's plenty more diversity up top, yeah. a lot more coverage, just seems healthier. Is it a lot softer too? It is, yeah, like you can feel. Yeah. You know, it only gets better. This is just a stage, mm -hmm. you know, going from compacted to repairing it through regeneration and use of animals. Animals in management. So this one here, you can see there's oh, more yeah. residue. Just different layer of comp yeah. kind of composting. That's really cool to see. So, and then that other soil, the compacted area, mm -hmm. get more of this. Yeah, a lot more of that. Light brown, you know, kind of grayish soil, more clay. You know, this is, this is just beautiful stuff. I could do this all day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this will only get one graze this year. So we've deferred grazing it to allow those roots to really push deep. Yeah. It also throws up a seed head. So now these cows, when we move them through, there's gonna be a trampling effect mm -hmm. and they're gonna actually knock that seed down and they'll work it in. So they're gonna fertilize on the way through through their manure and urine, but they're also gonna knock seed to the ground yeah. and push it in. Yeah, so, so they're your little workers. That's it, right? Yeah. The work smarter, not harder. Exactly, it's right back to it every time. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been so great seeing your farm and how you do things here. You bet, thank you, it was our pleasure. Awesome. So just getting ready to have a quick bite here, but I'm kind of just reminiscing on this whole experience and you know, the little takeaways from everywhere that I've been. So what really stood out to me at Becky and John's was just how lush the grass was. Um, and then just seeing all the different animals too. We did a cattle drive, we moved some cows, which was a whole new experience. They had a chicken bus, which was honestly a first time experience too, right? Um, and it was just really cool to see how they had everything set up. 
and to learn about how they move their animals. Um, you know, no use of tractors, anything like that. So all just by hand. So really hands-on and just a really cool experience. And then um, going over to Ben's, he was just a wealth of knowledge. Um, I feel like I could have asked him any question and he would have known the answer. And, you know, I know it's been really dry there. It's been in a drought. So just seeing, you know, how well they've been able to manage, maintain and keep the grass green there was just really eye-opening to see you know, how beneficial it can be to rotationally graze um, your cows. And then thinking of Donovan and Lisa, they had a lot more animals than I've seen yet. So they had pigs, they had turkeys, they had uh, chickens, ducks, geese, cows of course. And it was really cool seeing you know, the difference with like, the fencing styles because they're using of course electric fencing, right? So you're seeing these giant pigs and just one little wire keeping them in. And I thought that was pretty crazy because these are big, strong animals. Um, and they just have one little wire keeping them in and easy to move around again. Um, and it was really cool seeing like, the difference in grass where they had been. Um, also seeing like how the hay bales came into play with that, right? So moving the cows to the hay bales instead of moving the hay to the cows. That was really cool to see. When it came down to heading out to Clay and Ash, um, it was really interesting to just kind of learn a lot more about like how like the ecosystems like play a role together and he also dug up a couple different you know samples of soil to show me the difference between you know somewhere that was more like hard walked on and somewhere that had been grazed and they had baled there too and just seeing the difference in you know like the layers in the soil seeing the difference in the moisture in um, the texture and everything right it was just actually seeing it one compared to the other and noticing such a substantial difference, right? So it really just kind of goes to show what kind of a benefit this can have. And I definitely think it's something that I'm going to be, you know, utilizing at my small scale farm here. So I'm excited to get some electric fencing and get to work.